Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Dear friends, greetings in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, your wonderful salvation. It's our prayer, Lord God, that you'll speak to us through your word, by your spirit, and that by your grace people would not hear from any man, but only by your grace through a man. More than this, Lord God, we pray that your name will be glorified in our midst and you will keep us all faithful to you against that day. We pray these things asking and believing in the name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. Amen. I was watching the news yesterday. Don't need that. Sir. And with the news yesterday, there was a commentator coming on the news. And it talked about how, and this is not political, this was all, just was on the news, how the president and the attorney general have gone, went to court yesterday asking the court to overturn the protection of marriage law that 312 members, 342 members of the House of Representatives by a majority of 342 passed it. It was a very massive majority but he was, the government was asking the court to overturn it. That would force states to recognize same-sex marriage from another state and things and that they can call marriage anything, be it heterosexual or homosexual. It was the overwhelming majority of the people in every poll, the overwhelming majority of the Congress. But the president went to court to turn this around. <clears throat> and they were saying this is hypocritical because at the same time he was castigating the court for threatening to get rid of his health care thing. And that only had a seven vote majority in the House. <laughs> and you know, the hypocrisy of politicians and governments and courts well, Jesus said you'll be brought before magistrates and kings. We know these things are going to happen. God has a sense of humor that we've mentioned before in which he mocks his enemies. He literally mocks his enemies. He lets them become more and more persistent in what they are doing. He lets them go further and further down the road in which they're on. And he stops trying to convict them or, or correct them. He just lets them go beyond the point of no return. And they think that they're boastfully mocking God in their arrogance, not realizing God is laughing at them. They put their head into a noose from which there is no escape. That actually happens. Now we've seen various instances of this. We see it in the days of King Ahab with the prophet Micaiah. We know it will happen in the last days with the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we see the same thing in Romans. But before we turn to the Old Testament, I'd like to look at a few passages in the New. In the epistle of Jude, verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them, since they in the same way indulged in gross immorality. Notice it's not just immorality, it's called gross immorality. When after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same manner, these men, by dreaming and defile the flesh, etc., etc., they reject authority and revile angelic majesties. The fire and brimstone that came on Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of the eternal lake of fire into which they're plunged. The eternal lake of fire into which they are plunged. It doesn't matter if people agree or disagree. It only matters if it's true. That's the only thing that matters. When we look about the lake of fire in the book of Revelation, it's quite a frightening prospect about the ones who are outside the ones who were cast into the lake of the fire. And the first ones, it says, that are going into the lake of fire are homosexuals. They're the first ones who are going to be thrown eternally into the lake of fire. It talks about the ones who are outside the dogs, sorcerers, and moral. But when it comes to the lake of fire, it specifically mentions 
the people who are going to be thrown in, and it mentions the effeminate first. The first people Jesus is going to put into hell are homosexuals. They are the first ones. They are the ones that's going to go to the lake, the lake of fire and brimstone. We're told <coughs> there'll be overcomers, but then there'll be the other ones. And it's become a hate crime in some places to read those passages. There was a preacher in Sweden who was arrested for a hate crime. He was put in prison, spent about a month in prison. He got out on appeal to the European court, but he was locked up for 30 days for reading that on the streets of Stockholm, Sweden. In Canada and the western provinces about five years ago or four years ago, there was a pastor who was criminally charged for reading it in his church from the pulpit. He was fined 15,000 Canadian dollars, and if he didn't pay the fine, he'd be held in contempt of court. They're calling this hate crime. They're calling it hate crime to simply read it. And of course, they're going to have laws, and undoubtedly our corrupt government is going to support these laws. It uh, doesn't matter which political party, they're all godless. And they're going to support laws where they're going to try to say things like, you won't allow someone to be your pastor because they're a homosexual or a lesbian or something. Well, you're no longer tax exempt. <laughs> your building's now going to be taxable. That's what they're going to do. That's their agenda. And of course, godless politicians are going to support them. They become more and more arrogant, more and more assertive. This is going to happen. However, Peter puts this into an eschatological context. Second Peter also talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and he pairs it with Noah in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Second Peter. How God did not spare these guys in the ancient world, but if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, but he rescued righteous Lot but <clears throat> by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, etc. Radical homosexuality and lesbianism, militant homosexuality, these things are going to increase and increase and increase. They're going to get worse and worse. Now you know they had the Proposition 8 in California. Quite a thing. Originally, Rick Warren supported Proposition 8. Then after it passed by in the election, he actually went on TV and denied he ever supported it. Dave Hunt showed the clip of Rick Warren openly lying. Rick Warren openly lying, proven to be a liar, openly publicly lying. I've watched it myself. Dave Hunt has the clip. And they showed it at a conference. It was quite a thing. Well, what happened? Something that was not banked on. A lot of black people who are politically liberal also have traditional family values and a lot of Hispanics who might be politically liberal also have family values and the black and Hispanic vote in California went with the evangelical conservative vote and they passed Proposition 8. They didn't bank on that. They just assume if you're a member of a minority you're going to do what you're told by the liberals. And when that didn't happen, what did they do? Well, they took it to court and a homosexual judge ruled against the expressed democratic will of the people. Right. Who appointed the judge? George Bush. Who nominated the judge? Ronald Reagan. It doesn't matter Democrat or Republican. They're all evil, they're all corrupt. We're getting what we deserve as a nation. Godless nations will get godless governments. Godless nations will get godless governments. Look what you have a choice between now. You have a choice between Barack Obama with a gay and lesbian picnic on the White House lawn and a Mormon who says that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. It doesn't matter. These are the, these are the, this is the choice you get. The choice is no choice. The choice is no choice. There's no democracy. You know, the fact that most people don't want it, that doesn't matter. The fact that most people believe in at least an intelligent design doesn't matter. You can't teach that in schools. You have to teach evolution, even though most people don't believe in random evolution. It doesn't matter. There's no democracy. They say it, but, they, but they're lying. The minority dictates to the majority. And it's getting worse. Now, the reason this is the case is obviously we're under God's judgment. Democracy in, in, in the modern sense, in the Protestant democracies in Britain and America, came from the influences of Scripture. Right. 
now that people have abandoned the Judeo-Christian heritage and turned their backs on, on God and on the word of God, the democracy is going. They pretend to be democratic, but there's no democracy. They're charging people with hate crimes for reading this stuff. They're just charging people with hate crimes. And that's what they're going to do. And it's going to get worse before Jesus comes. Homosexuals and lesbians are going to become more radical and more militant. No political party is going to stand up for biblical morality. None. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans. They're all hypocrites. They're all liars. You can't trust or believe any of them. We're commanded to pray for them, but you cannot trust or believe any of them. There's no political savior going to do anything. Some of the worst judges who've been the most anti-Christian were appointed by Republicans. I pointed this out a number of times. It was Eisenhower's Supreme Court with, uh, he was a Republican, with Earl Warren that ordered God out of the classroom. It was Nixon's Supreme Court, he appointed Warren Burger, ordered God out of the maternity ward, Roe v. Wade. It was Reagan, Sandra Day O'Connor, he appointed her, ordered God out of the courtroom. This is Reagan. This is Eisenhower. This is Nixon. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat. Godless nations will get godless leaders. Countries that have turned their back on the Word of God are going to get leaders who don't care about the Word of God. They may lie about it to, to, to get a Christian vote or, or, or something. They may lie and pretend to be Christian, or, but they're lying. You're going to get the leaders we deserve. The homosexual agenda has become more and more radical in Britain and Europe, and it's becoming more and more radical in America. It's got Hollywood on back of it, it's got a lot of things on back of it, and there's no stopping it. The minority dictates to the majority. Forget about democracy. Pure democracy, constitutional democracy, no longer exists. Those things are not going to protect us anymore. Those things will not protect us anymore. The faith of the founding fathers no longer undergirds the Constitution, hence the Constitution is something that you can violate or ignore. The governments don't care about it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which party, it doesn't matter which president, it doesn't matter which politician. They are all evil, evil men. Nations get the leaders they deserve, just like in the books of Kings and Chronicles. There's nothing going to stop it except the return of Jesus. Why? It gets to the point where God gives them over. It's going to become more radical and more assertive. Homosexuals are going to be more demanding. They can't have children, they want yours. They want the right to teach this in schools, and if you oppose it, they'll accuse you of a hate crime. They're going to try to make it where if parents opt for homeschool and things like this, they're going to begin dictating the curriculum for homeschoolers if they can. They're going to do this. If they find out the parents are teaching their children it's wrong, they're going to send social services around to the parents. And, you know, in, in Britain I can certainly say social services are staffed with large numbers of lesbians and homosexuals. People who don't have children are going to tell you how you can raise yours. And they'll be backed by godless politicians. This is the work of Satan. It's the work of Satan. The world is in the power of the wicked one. It's completely debaucherous. But we're told in Second Peter what's going to happen. He condemned Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's going to happen again. But we're also told he rescued Lot before it happened. One of the signs of the last days is going to be a radical increase in homosexuality and lesbianism. It's going to get worse. But that also shows the judgment of God is indeed coming, but that the rescue of God is also indeed coming. Amen. Let's finally, before we turn to the Old Testament, look at Romans chapter 1. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. People become futile in their speculations rather than acknowledge God. One of the most aggressive internationally, but he's based in Britain, is an Oxford professor called Richard Dawkins. Very anti-God, very 
much a Darwinist. And he's lost a number of debates. In one of the debates in which he was defeated, although he never admits he's too narcissistic to admit defeat, but he lost on uh, any objective observer of the debate would say he lost on points. <laughs> he was forced to admit there's an intelligent design of the universe simply based on the probabilities of uh, genetic coding. The code somebody had to write it. Codes don't emerge from nowhere. Information cannot come from a vacuum. Coded information cannot come from a vacuum. He was forced to admit it. <clears throat> so rather than say there's a god or a creator, he said aliens from another planet could have genetically, could have genetically seeded <laughs> planet Earth. It's easier to believe the flying saucers came down here, deposited some nucleic acids, <laughs> and then flew, flew off. <laughs> this is an Oxford professor. Forced to admit there has to be an intelligent design, this is what he comes up with. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they become fools. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Just looking at biostatics, just looking at medical statistics, you don't get it. A homosexual is four times more likely to cause a serious automobile collision. Six times more likely to be a smoker. Eight times more likely to be a substance abuser. Hundreds of times more likely to develop certain cancers like Corposi sarcoma. In the developed world, thousands of times, thousands of times more statistically predisposed to HIV infection. You're talking about a reduced longevity, an average reduced longevity that can go 25 years and upwards of 25 years, it's killing people. You simply give them the medical facts. If this is normal, why is it killing you? Apart from the fact it's non-reproductive, finally penetrative same-sex relationships with any other vertebrae in the animal kingdom zoologically, they can't give you one. There is not a medical doctor in the world that will not tell you that intestinal tissue is single strata columbar epithelium. It is not designed to facilitate penetration. It is medically dangerous. It lacerates and intestinal tissue is highly absorptive. It's super prone to infection. No medical doctor can deny that. What else do they want to ban as hate literature? The New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, <laughs> Gray's Anatomy, professing to be wise, they become fools. If you don't ignore hard medical facts, then you're a homophobe. If you don't deny hard zoological facts, you're a homophobe. Fools, professing to be wise, they become fools. If you don't suspend all critical faculty and throw your brain out the window, you're a bigot. That's what it comes to. And that's what they want to teach kids in school. I mean, that's what they want to teach little kids in school. And God sees this. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God in verse 23 for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Just like in ancient Babylon, if you stop worshiping the real God, you'll worship something else. If you don't worship the creator, you'll worship the creation, but notice the worship of the creation becomes inextricably linked, coupled, to debased immorality. <laughs> Just like in ancient Babylon, the immorality, the deba uh, debased immorality, is coupled to idolatry.
in the loss of their hearts to impurity, a catharsis. There's a mixture. There's always a mixture of something that's good and bad, something that is natural and unnatural. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Now look at verse 26. <clears throat> for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. He gives them over to it. For their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. It begins with lesbianism. In the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the dual penalty of their error. In the Torah, God told the Jews, the Hebrews, keep my commandments that it may be well with you. God does not need us to live morally for his sake. He wants us to live morally for our sakes that it may go well with you. He doesn't want people to die 25, 30 years before their time from AIDS or Carposi sarcoma. He's a God of love. Now again, this is being recorded. Understand, I'm not preaching hatred of homosexuals. I'm for homosexuals. So because I'm for homosexuals, I'm against what is killing them. Do not tell me that as a believer, as a Christian, as a Judeo-Christian, I need to approve of something that kills people. I love people who have lung cancer. Therefore, I hate cigarette smoking because it's killing people I'm called upon to love. I'm called upon to love homosexuals. Therefore, I hate the homosexuality that's killing them. For the record, in my teenage years, before I was a Christian, I was addicted to cocaine. My sin would have put me in the same hell as their sin. I am not saying I am any better than them. I am just forgiven. But I know that the same Lord who saved me can save them. Amen. I'm not against you if you're listening and you're a homosexual. I'm not trying to destroy you. But God is trying to prevent you from destroying yourself. But if you keep doing it, you know it's not natural. Natural reason tells you it's not natural. He'll give you over to it to think it's natural. The unnatural becomes natural to them. You look at who is the feminists who are the most pro-abortion, the most radical pro-abortion, they're lesbians. Why? Because every time they see a baby or an expectant mother, it's an indictment of their own failure as women. <laughs> They know that they are psychologically and physiologically and spiritually designed for maternity. And they're not going to be mothers. Now I accept the fact that some people have a higher calling than others. They have the grace to be single for the work of the Lord. That is a higher calling than marriage. Some people have that grace. I accept that for perhaps some medical reason, some people are unable to have children. I accept that. That's not a problem. That's not the kind of people I'm aiming at, obviously. I'm speaking about people who, simply because of their orientation, will never be parents, so they want the right to adopt or artificially inseminate and bring children up in this relationship. So now you can bring a child up in it. That becomes their example, so the child becomes predisposed to an abnormal orientation, and now the child's predisposed to die sooner. We don't let people who smoke cigarettes they're not candidates for adoption, they're not eligible. We do not let people who have a record of genetic disease, like RH, negative, RH people and things like this, people prone to hemophilia, we don't allow them to adopt. They're not allowed to be candidates for adoption. Why? Because it can affect the children, even passive smoking. Yet for homosexuals and lesbians, we have to make an exception, even though that lifestyle will also kill them. And if you don't agree to predispose the children to a lifestyle that's going to kill them, you're a homophobe. You don't love. This is how perverted they become. Once a society begins messing with children, the Lord gets very angry. 
It's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea than to hurt one of these little ones. Once you begin putting this on kids, God gets ready to move. Now it's not yet his judgment. They're reaping the consequences of their own lifestyle. His judgment is coming. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, in verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. That's the second time it says he gave them over. In this short passage, it reiterates it again. He gives them over to it. Then Paul goes into a litany of things. He repeats what the world's going to be like in Timothy in the last days. But he concludes by saying in verse 32, And also they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Three times it says God gives them over. But he doesn't just give them over. He gives over those who condone it. These judges and politicians are going to go to the same judgment. They're going to go to the same judgment. It's also those who approve of it. And it says they give hearty approval. Politicians can't wait to make speeches in favor of what they call homosexual rights. They call it gay, a lifestyle that kills people. Well, this is either true or false, right or wrong. When you see them becoming more and more boisterous, arrogant, assertive, militant, they don't know that God is laughing at them now. That God has handed them over to destruction. He sees what is ahead for them and he's now laughing at them. The God they mock, mocks them. As always, he who laughs last, laughs best. We know who's going to have the last laugh. They will spend eternity in the lake of fire. It doesn't matter if they believe it or not. When they get there, they'll believe it. It doesn't matter that uh, you had false teachers like the late John Stott saying there is no lake of fire. Jesus spoke quite plainly of the conscious judgment. Nonetheless, let's go on. With these things in view, turn with me, please to the 18th chapter of Genesis. Remember the rescue narratives of Scripture. Every rescue narrative, the exodus of the Jews, the rescue of Lot and his family in this case, the rescue of Noah and his family, the rescue of Rahab and her family, these rescues are all types of the rapture as was the rescue of the believers in 70 AD from Jerusalem. Notice in each case, it involves families. God is not simply in the business of saving individuals. He's in the business of saving families. <laughs> in each case, it's families. You know, it was Rahab and her family. In the Hebrews, with the Hebrews at Exodus, with the Passover, they had to eat it as a family. You know, Lot and his family. Noah and his family. The Lord wants to get us out of here, but he wants our families to come with us. This goes directly against the anti-family ethos of homosexuality and lesbianism. Satan does not want the image and likeness of God being recapitulated through procreation. Only Adam and Eve can do that, so therefore Satan comes up with Adam and Steve. But it doesn't work. They don't have families. They try to mimic, but they don't have families. Well, let's look. Chapter 18, let's begin. Verse 20. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly great. I'll go down now, see all they've done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me and if not I will know then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord notice this was not a apparition of the Trinity 
Whenever God appears in human form, it's Jesus, it's Jesus with the two angels who are with him. The two angels go off towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus is left standing there. This is Jesus. It's never the Father, never the Spirit. Whenever you see an appearance of God in a human form in the Old Testament, it's a Christophany, it's always the Son. Okay. So Abraham is left standing before the Lord, but the two angelic beings go to Sodom, <coughs> went towards Sodom. And Abraham came near and said, Will thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou indeed sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from me to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from me, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, I'll spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham answered and said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Wilt thou destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I'll not destroy it if I find forty-five there. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak, suppose thirty are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I'll not destroy it on account of the twenty. Well, Abraham was the first Jew. He was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. And you can tell he was a Jew because he, <laughs> he's negotiating. Only a Jew would have the audacity to try to get God down. <laughs> In the Jewish faith, you need ten bar mitzvah circumcised adult males to take the Torah scrolls out of the Torah cabinet and to have a worship service. It's called a minyan, a minyan. You must have a minimum of ten. And this comes from this story, this narrative of the rescue of Lot. What happens when there's not even a minyan? In the last days, this is what it's going to be like. Homosexuality and lesbianism will become so radical and so militant, there will be fewer and fewer believers willing to take a stand and speak against it. We are already seeing it. We've already, always had it among liberals, I suppose, but now you see it among Tony Campolo, Brian McLaren, the Emergent Church. They're all saying, we have to accommodate homosexuals and homosexuality even within churches where the people are born again you can be born again and be a homosexual or practicing lesbian now I know homosexuals and lesbians who the Lord has set free of these perversions the same as he set me free of my addiction nonetheless this is the reality not even a minion there's going to be fewer and fewer churches pastors even Christians who are going to be willing to take a stand against it. There will not even be a minyan. And he said in verse 32, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I'll not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. Not even a minyan. Not even a minyan. There will no longer be enough faithful believers. There will no longer be enough faithful congregations, fellowships, to prevent or even further delay the judgment of God. We will reach a point before Jesus comes, there will not be enough faithful believers or enough faithful fellowships to delay the judgment, even delay it, let alone prevent it. not even a minyan. Now there's a few cultural nuances we have to understand about the ancient Near East. Hospitality to this day means everything. Biblical anthropologists will study Bedouin culture to this day because it has changed so little since patriarchal times. They study their music and things like this to see what the Psalms of David might have sounded like in their original composition, all kinds of things. Bedouin culture has changed very little. 
I've been with Bedouins, I've been in Bedouin tents and things like that. And you are responsible for a traveler up to three days to whom you show hospitality. There is nothing worse than something happened to somebody who goes into your house or your tent because your survival in that kind of desert environment might depend on their hospitality. That is still, in, even in the modern world, the thinking among Bedouins. In the ancient world, probably more so. Also in the ancient world, there was a, uh, not the distinction between betrothal and marriage. Once somebody was betrothed, even though they're not married, they were already your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law. That is why Joseph would have had to divorce Mary. Once the, the engagement was legally binding, you were already legally married. Okay. Well, so it goes on. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down his face to the ground. And said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and watch, wash your feet, that you may rise early and go your way. And they said, however, No, we will spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered the house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. One more cultural nuance, and then we'll look at some of the eschatological nuances. Sitting at the gate is where the village or the town eldership would convene. It became an idiomatic expression for being a member of the community leadership, like on the town council or the municipal council or something like that. He was enlisted among the leaders of the village. He had a civil position. A time will come for believers where their secular positions in the temporal world will not avail them anything. It won't matter if they're a member of the Congress or the legislature or they're a civil servant or a distinguished professor or an accomplished you know, academic or, or anything like this or, or successful business person or an executive in a corporation. Their secular temporal positions aren't going to avail them of anything. They're going to have a choice. Either they're going to sell out or they're going to stand and their position isn't going to help them anymore. Nobody is going to be immune. Lot sat at the gates, but it didn't help him. Now understand, Lot is like the church is going to be before Jesus comes. There'll be so much evil, he's resigned himself to trying to get along with it. He will have resigned himself to try to get along with it, since in his frustration he couldn't do anything about it, he just accepts that that's the way it is and tries to get along with it. Well, that only works up to a point it gets to a point where that's not going to work. These people redefine tolerance. Tolerance to them no longer means you are willing to tolerate their beliefs or their lifestyle even though you disagree with it. Tolerance means you must affirm it. You must condone it, sanction it, even to some degree, perhaps participate in it. And if you don't, then you're intolerant. They don't mean tolerance. The, the people who talk the most about tolerance are the most intolerant. Right. We have, in the liberal idiocracy, you have people always going on about tolerance of, for Islam. Don't be, don't be an Islamophobe. <laughs> Yet when you ask the liberal idiocracy, show me one Islamic country that will give Christians or Jews the rights they get in America, or Britain, or Canada, or Israel, they can't show you one. That's why I call it the idiocracy. They can't even show you one example. The people who rage about tolerance the most are the most intolerant. Yeah. Be they Muslim activists, be they homosexual and lesbian activists, the ones who talk about tolerance the most, the more they talk about tolerance, the less tolerant they themselves are. Right. It's utter hypocrisy. Remember the evening. It begins to get dark. Most of you know Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night, etc.? He's coming like a thief in the night. The wise and foolish virgins, the bridegroom comes in the night. And the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes in the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. It is getting dark out. 
a tremendous darkness will overtake this planet before Jesus comes. So it's getting dark. Now, Lot is able to recognize that these men are angelic beings. Angels can come in human form. Angels can come in human form. So can demons. Ultimately, the Nephilim did that, and that will happen again. That's another story. I only mentioned it in passing. Nonetheless, he urged them to stay with him. They ate unleavened bread. Before the Jews were rescued at the Passover, what happens? They had to eat unleavened bread. The Last Supper was the Passover Seder. Jesus said, let these go. <laughs> they had to eat matzah, unleavened bread. Okay. The good and faithful servant gives the proper food at the proper time. That's in a Paschal context in the Olivet Discourse. Unleavened bread is another eschatological nuance, but let's look at it. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, and called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Now we understand the following. The idea of surrounding. Remember when Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded? <laughs> we will reach a point where God's people will be surrounded. We will have no way out but God. When the rapture happens, we will be surrounded. There will be no way out but God. We also see another phenomenon. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee to the mountains, right? Noah went to Mount Ararat, head for the hills, flee to the mountains. The Maccabees, when they saw Antiochus, went to the mountains, head for the hills. So the men came, the homosexuals came in gangs, surrounded the house, both young and old, from every quarter, from every quarter. One generation ago, there were certain places where homosexuals went. They'd go to San Francisco, they'd go to, to, to the West Greenwich Village in New York, they would go to the Volcare in New Orleans. There were certain places people knew that that's where they congregated. That's where they went. And everybody knew that's where their communities were. They would go there from other places. Now it's all over. Now it's in every quarter. It's in every neighborhood. It's no longer a subculture. It's becoming culturally mainstream like it was in the first century in the Greco-Roman world. From every quarter, and they call Lot and said, where are the men who came to you? Bring them out that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door after him. Notice Lot shuts the door. When Lot shut the door, it didn't work. It's only the Lord who shuts and no one opens. Lot shuts the door, and look what he says. Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. <laughs> he begins calling them his brothers. He, he appeals to a sense of common ground, of camaraderie. I saw Rick Warren doing this on a, on a film about three weeks ago, talking to a Muslim, my Muslim brother. These people are not our brothers. If someone is not born again, they are not our brother, unless they're a biological brother, but they're not our brothers. He tries to make this appeal. We have common ground and we have to get along, you know, multi-faith, multi-ethnic, multi-pansexual. That stuff is not going to work. Right. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do whatever you like to them, only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. Again, he's responsible for their welfare. And of course he knew that these guys didn't like girls. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he's acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. They begin leaning on Lot. We'll treat you worse than them. Who are you? You're not one of us. 
This idea that believers will be able to be part of the social mainstream, members of mainstream society, a point is going to come where that will no longer be a practical possibility. You will either sell out and go the way of the world, but if you stand on the teachings of Christ, it's not going to be possible anymore. They're going to lean on you, will treat you worse than them. Who do homosexuals hate the most? The people who oppose homosexuality. It's not enough that you're willing to tolerate it among that lifestyle, among mutually consenting adults. That's not enough. If you say, I don't want it and I don't believe it because I think it's wrong, they're going to hate you. The demands are going to get worse and worse. They're going to become more and more violent. Not realizing that that's just simply going to the natural conclusions that God has handed them over to. Not knowing what awaits them. And what awaits them soon. Who are you? You're acting like our judge will we'll treat you worse than them. They pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Once they shut the door, once the messengers of God shut the door, then it couldn't open. Now understand there are many people who prefigure the two witnesses in Revelation 11. People always ask, is it Moses and Elijah, Moses and Enoch? In the Middle East, some Christians believe one of them is the Apostle John. You don't hear that outside the Middle East, but it's an opinion some people have, at least as a possibility in the Middle East. Well, those are all valid questions. Obviously, they have to do with the two olive trees and Zechariah 4, etc. But there are many people who prefigure, foreshadow those two witnesses. I've said this before. Certainly the two spies who rescued Lot and her family, and so do the two angels, I'm sorry, who rescued Rahab and her family, and so do the two angels who rescue Lot and his family. These are all foreshadowings of the two witnesses in some way. Nonetheless, let's look. They pull them in, and then they shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they weary themselves trying to find the doorway. Can you imagine losing your eyesight, being struck with blindness, and somebody having lost their eyesight is so controlled, so animated by an unnatural lust, by an unnatural passion, so consumed and controlled by something that is not even natural that they're trying to satiate the lust instead of trying to find out who turned off the lights. <laughs> if a heterosexual lost their eyesight suddenly, they'd want an ophthalmologist, they'd want to get to a hospital or to an emergency room or casualty. Well, I can't help, help, help. If it was a heterosexual, I don't care if the object of your affections, you know, was Marilyn Monroe or Brad Pitt or whatever. It doesn't matter how good looking they were. Once you lost your eyesight, you'd have other priorities. Can you imagine a drive, a perverted drive that could control people to this degree? The only thing I've ever seen do that is chemical addiction. It is a proven fact that alcoholics suffering delirium tremen, they actually drink methyl alcohol. You know, a junkie will do anything for a shot of smack if he's going cold turkey. I, I know in chemical addiction that can happen. But we're talking about a, draw, a sex drive. How can an, an unnatural perversion push people to that length? It's not even rational. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Therefore, God has given them over. It's unbelievable that it can do that. that. That a perversion can control people the way a chemical addiction can. The only other people that I know of that you'll find that will do something like that are, are, are chemically addicted. Then it goes on. They struck them with blindness. Understand the full meaning of the word blindness. They can't see anymore. 
when God gives people over to something, they can't see how it's wrong or perverted. You can't reason with them, they can't see how it's wrong or perverted. They've been given over to it. Their physical blindness is simply a is simply something which is emblematic of their spiritual blindness. <laughs> and then the men said to Lot, whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughter, whoever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. We're about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy the city. And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, up, now notice again, the betrothal was legal. They were already his sons-in-laws even though they had not married. Who were, up, who were to marry his daughters and said, up out of this place, the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. First of all, why were they outside the house instead of inside? <laughs> You've got people who say they're Christians who have one foot in the world, one foot in the church. The church I went to in New York before I immigrated to Israel and the church I still worship in in New York is Calvary Baptist Church. And Calvary Baptist Church is a history of famous preachers, like Alan Redpath and people like that. And Stephen Olford it has a history of famous preachers in it. It upholds the true gospel, it preaches the true gospel, it expounds the word of God quite well. Now they have a Jewish pastor named Epstein, and it's, a, it's, a, it's where I worship when I'm in New York. Tomorrow, Easter Sunday. In addition to the, it's a sizable church, but tomorrow on Easter Sunday, in addition to the normal Sunday service, they're going to have a second service. Why? Because there's people who say they're saved. There's people who say they're evangelical. There's people who say they're born again who come to church at Christmas and Easter. So they have to put on a second service. Where are they going to be next Sunday, and where were they last Sunday? In New York, there's something called the Easter Parade. It's where people show up to Spring Fashions on Fifth Avenue. They put on these nice outfits and dresses and things like this, and they go to church. It's just cultural. Now, these are people who say they're, they're saved Christians, you understand? <laughs> These are not, oh, you got the same thing with the Catholics and the liberal Protestants, but this is, these people say they're saved. They're quite happy to be in the world. Why weren't they in the house? What chance do people like that have of being raptured, rescued? Look what it says. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They think the rescue is a joke. Just like Gerald Coates in England, the rapture is a fantasy and a myth, teaches that deceiver. Mike Bickle of the Kansas City False Prophets, the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. Rick Joyner, the rapture is a lie of the devil. They think it's a joke. Rick Warren tells people avoid end time prophecy. They think it's a joke. If you think the rescue is a joke, how are you going to get rescued? Right. They're set up by the devil and they don't even know it. They're not in the church, they're out in the world. And they're quite comfortable to be out there the way the world is. They think it's a joke. There are people today who think the rapture is a joke. There's people teaching all kinds of nonsense. Some, some are trying to say it was only invented in the 19th century. What a lie! What, the Thessalonians isn't in their Bible? The word rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it is. Harpezo. Unbelievable what they come out with. And when morning dawns, Remember, dawn in an eschatological context is always typologically illustrative or, or alludes to resurrection in some way. Jesus rose at dawn. The angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife, your daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. 
and they bought him and put him out of the city. Notice even Lot hesitated. It was only the compassion of the Lord that got him out of there. Will Son of Man find faith on earth? No, he will find the faithful remnant, and even they won't be all that faithful. It is only the compassion of Jesus that is going to get us out of here. That's right. The righteous are scarcely saved. It is only the compassion of Jesus that is going to get us out of here. What chance do the others have? None. Remember, no matter what anybody tells you, the foolish virgins are going no place. The foolish virgins go no place. Verse 17, and it came about when they brought them outside, that one said, escape for your life, do not look behind you, do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, lest you be swept away. What did Jesus say in the Olivet Discourse? When you see Jerusalem surround, when you're surrounded, flee to the mountains. Let he who was in the field not go back for his cloak. Let he who was in the house not go back for his possessions. Don't look back. Just get out of here. Head for the hills. Look up. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Now behold, this town is small enough to flee to. It's a, it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small that my life may be saved? And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Za'ar. There are different theories as to the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. Geologists, particularly seismologists who've been to this area at the southern tip of the Dead Sea, say that there is ample seismological and geological evidence of some kind of cataclysm that may have been volcanic, but nobody knows where Sodom and Gomorrah were. They're obliterated. Some theorize they're on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea, others that it's under the Dead Sea, others that they don't know but there is certainly uh, molten rock and, and petrified ash and things like this. We do know, however, where Za'ad is. I've been to Za'ad many times. It's a hill looking down over the valley. It must have been close to that. We can, you can stand on Ramat Za'ad to this day and they know exactly where it is. I've been there a number of times. Now this is a little bit complicated. For the Jews who go through the entire tribulation, there'll be some kind of a flight to the area of Mount Sair, Petra, a place that's put aside before the maelstrom comes, <laughs> okay, where they'll be protected until the Lord comes and gets them out of there. Okay, that's what this corresponds to. It's a type of that. I only mention that in passing. I've been to Petra a number of times as well, but this just foreshadows that. The sun had risen over the earth. Now look what it says. I, behold, I can't do anything until you arrive there. The Lord is not going to smite this place until he gets his own people out. His judgment is coming. His wrath is coming. Can't do anything until I get you out of here. It's a good thing to be packed and ready. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, which Peter tells us is a picture of these people going to hell forever. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Now this is an incredible place. It's the lowest place on the face of the earth, the Dead Sea. This is at the southern tip of the Dead Sea. It is only a very few miles from a place called 
Ein Bokek, Ein Bokek. I can take you to the exact area, but I can't show you where Sodom and Gomorrah were. They're obliterated. There's no trace of them. But I can show you where they had to be approximately. He overthrew the cities and what grew on the ground? Nothing grows there. Nothing grows there. There's no biological life in the Dead Sea. Too, too, too salinated and nothing, not even sagebrush, not cactus, virtually nothing grows there. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Don't look back, but he was in the house, not go back. Don't look back for your Those who want to hold on to this life and this world may look back. Now there are many pillars of salt in this particular area on the southern tip of the Dead Sea near Ein Bokek. There's many pillars of salt. I have no idea which one Lot's wife is, but I assume she must be one of them. <laughs> Liberals, of course, would just say this is a myth to explain the pillars of salt. You know, an ancient myth, it's not a myth. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the valley, and he saw and behold the smoke of the land ascend like the smoke of a furnace, just like in Revelation. The smoke of their torment went up, and yo to enyones, forever and ever. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abram, Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. He rescued righteous Lot. And even Lot was not all that righteous, but he was faithful, he did believe. Notice the family was split. God likes to save families, but this is a big issue. Parents will turn against children, children against parents. Families can and will split in the last days. Our unsaved loved ones, it's a big issue. Nonetheless, what happened then is going to happen again. Every rescue narrative is a picture of the rapture, unveils some aspect of the coming rescue. This is not just past history, it is future history. Yes, it happened. Its historicity is valid, it all happened. But that's not what's most important. What's most important is it's going to happen again. The main reason we study what did happen is to understand what's going to happen. Or I should say, what is happening? Not even a minyan. There are fewer and fewer faithful Christians and fewer and fewer churches preaching the truth. There will not be enough salt and light to preserve anymore. He will have to intervene to get his own people out before judgment comes. Homosexuals become more and more militant and assertive and those who condone what they do give hearty approval to it, including the President of the United States. They give hearty approval to it. They've been given over to destruction. They are going to hell. If God has given you over to it, how can you repent? It's almost impossible. Very few people who are given over to something will ever, ever repent of it. How will Barack Obama not go to hell? The theoretical possibility is there, but the like, every like, he's going to go to hell. How can the judge that Reagan appointed not go to hell and kill? He's going to go to hell. How can Peter Thatchell? whose parents were Pentecostal. Not go to hell. Peter Thatchell is going, he's a homosexual activist, is going to hell. That lesbian I saw on Fox News today, she's going to hell. They have no place to go but hell. God is mocking them. They're becoming more aggressive, insistent, assertive, militant, radical. God is laughing at them. They mock God, now he's mocking them. But they've gone even beyond that. They're putting it on children. They're destroying the family of a God who wants to save families. <laughs> Something's got to happen. Something has got to give. 
But then you have Christians. They should be in here. But they're out there. You talk to them about the rapture, the rescue, they think it's a joke. You've got others. They come to church. But when it comes time to flee, they want to look back. The first time in my life, the Lord took everything I had materially and financially. I was on my way to being a self-made millionaire when I was in my 20s. And the Lord called me to the mission field. I lost everything. I had experienced God's breaking. That was the first time. Then I maybe had a little bit of a nest egg in Israel with my family, and I was there, and you know, I was co-leading a congregation. But then the Lord called me to go to seminary in England. <laughs> Next time, <laughs> well, I had to sell my, my condo and my apartment in Israel. I had to get rid of everything. Lost everything again. <laughs> everything out the window. Then, I get recruited out of seminary as evangelistic director of Pentecostal Mission to the Jews in England. Oh, he's a Hebrew speaker. <laughs> we'll get him. Then the Assemblies of God in Elam were going in with the American money preachers and stuff like that. And I, I bailed that. There it goes. <laughs> Every time I get a piece of the pie, I've got to throw it out the window. Well, maybe someday the Lord will restore the fortunes of Judah. I don't know. But he certainly met my needs anyway, praise God. And I'd rather that than be in a situation where the things I own own me. <laughs> the first time it was the God's breaking. The second and third time, I just had to trust him for the grace to, to trust him. <laughs> I had to turn my back on everything I had materially and financially in order to do what he wanted me to do. Well, it wasn't easy. But I know there's a lot of Christians that are going to look back, they're going to try to hold on to stuff. Now again, the problem is not possessions or money. The problem is us. <laughs> the people I know who can handle wealth philanthropically, and remember there is a gift of philanthropy in Romans chapter 12. The people God blesses financially because use them to bless others. You'll find one characteristic about them. If they lost everything tomorrow, it wouldn't affect their faith. <laughs> if they lost everything tomorrow, they would still believe the same stuff and live the same way. <laughs> but there's a lot of people can't do that. We live in the age of Laodicea. We live in the age of Laodicea. This is a big danger. There are a lot of Lot's wives in the church. Now again, I'm not condemning anyone for affluence or success. I'd rather see the Christians with the money than the unsaved people, believe me. I'm not in any way demeaning success or, you know, the ambition or things. I'm no problem with any of that stuff. The problem is with our attitude towards this stuff. If you're not willing to let it go, you don't own it, it owns you. That's what happened to Lot's wife. That is going to be a big issue in the last days for a lot of Christians. Although it wasn't easy, I thank God he kept taking it away from me. <laughs> if I ever get it, I'm not going to trust it. <laughs> if I ever get it again, I've learned the hard way. Don't hold on to it. <laughs> Too tight. When you have to get out of here, it's not coming with you. <laughs> It might keep you here. <laughs> you have the wrong attitude. She looked back. Others think it's a joke. Others are out there. That's the way it was. This is exactly the way it's going to be before Jesus comes. There is no stopping the militant homosexual and lesbian agenda. We can pray, we can vote, we can assert our own rights, and I'm not saying it's wrong to do those things. But realize God has given them over to it. That has to happen. It has to happen. And the state of the church, 50, 45, 30, 30 there will not even be a minyan. 
Once there's no longer a minyan, get ready to leave. <laughs> Once they mess with the kids and with families, get ready to leave. Once you see people who should know better, who are out there when they should be in here, get ready to leave. Once you see people who should be getting rescued, thinking the rescue was a joke, get ready to leave. Once you see a lot of Christians looking back on material possessions, get ready to leave. I don't know how much longer it's going to be before the Lord comes. But how much longer can it be? The way things are going, there's not even a minion. God bless you.